Hello, today is June 8th, 2012. I'm John Weingart with the Center on the American Governor at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University. I'm delighted to be able to welcome here today former Governor of Massachusetts, Jane Swift. Thank you for coming. Um, now you were governor from uh, April of 2001 until January of 2003. Right. Um, so you, you were in the job only a few months when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the role, your role as a governor um, dealing with that kind of emergency where Massachusetts was a major, a major site in the, in the events there? So it fundamentally changed um, my tenure in office. I, as you said, had only been governor for a short period of time. I'd given birth to twins, um, and so uh, had and that actually was in August or July. Or uh, no, I gave birth actually in May. I should okay. remember that yeah. date. Um, <clears throat> so um, I was just getting back up to a very full uh, travel schedule, and I think that. Um, the two most significant things were a focus on domestic terrorism and homeland security. And because two of the um, planes that took down the World Trade Center came out of Logan Airport, which is overseen by uh, Massachusetts Public Sector Authority, um, we were very involved in both addressing risks and threats and security at home, mm -hmm. as well as commenting on things that I thought uh, were necessary after 9-11 in our new normal. So, uh, for example, Logan Airport in Boston never had uh, had outsourced, uh, contracted uh, screeners at all of our checkpoints. And post 9-11, um, that turned out to uh, have been probably not a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't a lot of consistency in the training, uh, a lot of security checks. And so uh, I testified before Congress uh, to have TSA be uh, instituted as mm -hmm. part of Homeland Security. Now, I travel a lot for my job now, so be careful. Uh, you have to live by those things right. that you've right. created. So I can't uh, be as upset about taking my shoes off at security mm -hmm. as some of my fellow uh, road warriors. But uh, on a serious note, I mean, there were just numerous, numerous considerations that really dominated my agenda that um, but for 9-11 uh, would have never risen to a level of attention. We did significant reforms in how we oversaw um, our airport, the quasi-public authority Massport that uh, ran the airport had was in need um, of some restructuring, and we got some terrific people to do a private sector commission. Um, you know, I got calls in the middle of the night about uh, white um, powder oh, being right. found mm -hmm. in a variety of sundry uh, places. I no longer was able actually to check my own mail mm -hmm. uh, for a while after 9-11. The security on my family and myself increased significantly. Um, I got a call at one point from the U.S. attorney uh, because they had some um, very active chatter uh, mm -hmm. about a potential attack on uh, either Boston or New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it just fundamentally changed what I focused on. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, we had we were already starting to suffer some fiscal um, challenges because of the collapse of the dot com bubble, but those were greatly exacerbated by 9/11. So um, post 9/11, the almost two years that I spent in office were entirely dominated by fiscal issues and having to rein in spending mm -hmm. um, because of the drop off in revenue collections and public safety concerns at a uh, complexity that most governors had never considered before. Well, I, mean, I was wondering, uh, there's so much day-to-day -day pressure and decisions and choices for a governor I mean, and, and, and so many things you're involved with that I wonder in retrospect, or even at the time, whether you felt like you were, I mean, adequately prepared, or as prepared as you could have been for an event nobody could have anticipated as governor, um, and whether that le would lead to thoughts about how my current governors ought to prepare themselves for emergencies, or have have procedures in place, or 
responsible staff in place or, or, mm -hmm. or like that? So yes and no. Uh -huh. um, I did not personally have any deep expertise, sure. nor uh, had I focused at all on public safety or terrorism issues. Um, I was, you know, really focused on improving public education mm -hmm. and uh, economic development, particularly for smaller businesses, focused on the environment and protecting family farms. Um, having said that, uh, maybe because of that, mm -hmm. I was extremely fortunate that the critical positions within my administration were populated with individuals who just were... Uh, extraordinarily competent and well qualified for the jobs that they had. So the uh, director of public safety, the head of the Massachusetts National Guard, the uh, attorney general actually, and I, the Massachusetts attorney general and I uh, worked more closely together. The U.S. attorney was someone I had worked with on other issues earlier, uh, our head of our Massachusetts state police. So um, there, you know, I have in the intervening 10 years, um, done some teaching in the leadership studies mm -hmm. department at Williams, and I do a whole section on crisis management. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe um, that who you assemble in critical positions is going to hold you in good stead for a crisis. So I guess one of my takeaways was to have really, really strong subject matter experts in positions particularly where you as governor don't have a lot of expertise um, because you don't know where the crisis will strike and having folks who know a lot more than you on critical subjects who have your trust mm -hmm. uh, to me was the biggest takeaway i fortunately had that not because i knew this ahead yeah. of time but in retrospect mm -hmm. it served me very very well I want to come back to the leadership studies question, but let me. So you became governor when the you, you were lieutenant governor, and the governor Paul Salucci became ambassador to Canada. Correct. And you became lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. um, what I mean, I know to some extent what that experience was like. At least as it was publicly reported. But but what did that lead you to think in in, in retrospect about how? how a lieutenant governor should be prepared for whoever is second in line should be prepared for that eventuality and were you briefed ahead of time how much time was there before you know when the governor knew he was leaving that you could anticipate and prepare? so for the mechanics of doing the job i was extraordinarily lucky because governor salucci uh and before him governor weld mm -hmm. for with whom he served as lieutenant governor really approached the um, executive office in a team spirit and so i sat in uh, even before governor salucci knew he was leaving uh, i sat in on every cabinet meeting and I sat in on every judicial selection. I sat in on every interview we had and was consulted in appointing cabinet members. So from a pure, uh, did I know what was going on? Was I ready to you know, know where I had to stand and sit and sign and make decisions? Absolutely. Um, I think the area where I was ill-prepared and I would counsel future uh, lieutenant governors, but I often counsel young women, is in um, making sure that I was always considering the potential ascension and doing the kind of networking and consult consulting of other individuals so that I would have been politically um, better prepared and better positioned mm -hmm. when the governor left. I. Um, made a mistake early in my time in statewide office as lieutenant governor, and I think a lot of women make this. Um, and I also had my first child was born shortly before I was elected. And so as a working mother, I had this concept as well that if I just did the you know, mechanics of the job really, really well. If I read every briefing book, if I knew every issue, you know, if I was just so well prepared, uh, then that would take care of everything. Mm -hmm. I'd be a great lieutenant governor. And the truth is there are a lot of other soft skills and activities mm -hmm. uh, that I should have been um, engaging in. Uh, key constituency groups that I should have been going to lunch with, mm -hmm. uh, individuals I should have been inviting into my office to seek their opinions so that I could have a broader view and, frankly, a broader uh, core of support if I uh, were to move 
uh, ahead in government. And I didn't do that. I didn't um, spend a lot of time courting the Boston media um, mm -hmm. and sort of building the political um, war chest uh, of you know goodwill that I needed when I became governor. Mm -hmm. I, I really felt, even after 9-11, um, I really felt I knew sort of what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I knew my position on the issues. Um, I knew many of my colleagues in the legislature, even though I was relatively young, I had been in the building. Mm -hmm. As they say, for some time, the um, Senate president that I served with uh, was someone I had worked with on education issues. The Speaker of the House was someone I had worked with on a number of different issues when I was in the state legislature. So, you know, I had the relationships, I had the knowledge, I had the subject matter expertise. I knew all the cabinet officials. I had helped to appoint them. They shared our agenda. It was really more in the, you know, building a reservoir of goodwill and people who wanted to see me succeed defining my narrative and who I was um, separate from the governor mm -hmm. that I didn't attend to when I was lieutenant governor. And I think that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Having said that, that's a tricky road say, for a lieutenant really governor. It's really easy to seem presumptuous or disloyal or something. If exactly. You do that. I think yeah. you have to be careful, yeah. but I think there are things that you can do skillfully mm -hmm. um, so that it, whenever it uh, um, happens, um, whether it's, you know, there's an open seat and you decide to mm. run. Um, but I just, I never even thought about it. Never mm. mind, did it. So when you became governor, um, did you make staff changes either right away or over time? or, or did you I made it? some staff changes. I was very cognizant mm. of not having a mandate. Many of the members of the cabinet were folks who I had input into hiring. Mm -hmm. um, I did not, uh, it, there was, you know, a lot of planning because I knew for a good period of time that the governor was likely to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so quiet planning, and I did not do any wholesale changes. I did change out some of the direct staff, and I think that's important. Direct staff, like your personal staff. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I brought actually with me a lot of folks who had worked mm -hmm. for me in the lieutenant governor's office. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing there is to decide which way you're going to approach it. You know, am I going to keep them or am I going to change them? And then whatever you do, you have to live with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you keep people, you have to trust them. So yeah. I think sometimes there's a tendency to say, you know, I have no authority to replace everybody, so I'll keep them. But then you try to work around them because you're not really sure uh, if they share your agenda. And I think I didn't have many instances of that, but I think that's the most dangerous route is to keep people even though you intend to sort of find other uh, places to uh, manage from for their responsibilities. So, I mean, there are various schools of thought about whether or very different approaches to relying on the cabinet and giving them somewhat free reign or large free reign or having your own personal mm -hmm. staff that focuses on issues. How did you look at that? And was that any different than the way Governor Salucci looked at it? Or? It wasn't different at all, except that um, I tended to have more meetings with my entire cabinet, mm -hmm. but I think that was also a function of the time. So as I said, um, you know, all of a sudden mm -hmm. public safety and terrorism issues were dominating um, my uh, agenda. I wasn't the only one who mm -hmm. knew that I, I didn't have a lot of experience in that. It was pretty obvious by looking at my resume. And so I think it served me well mm -hmm. to establish very regular meetings and consultations with that core group mm -hmm. uh, of people. They weren't really my entirety of my cabinet, but they were a subgroup of the cabinet with some other federal local federal officials that I met with regularly. And I think that helped both to um, reassure the public that mm -hmm. I was getting good advice, mm -hmm. but it also gave me really good insight and um, advice and, um, you know, just uh, policy uh, agenda items and information on those to move forward. Um, some, we also then had a very serious fiscal crisis mm -hmm. and I'm a Republican. Uh, I believe in a fiscal crisis, the most important thing you can do is to cut back and live within your means very quickly. The longer you wait, the worse it gets. Um, and I don't think that 
in the midst of a fiscal crisis is a good time to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. Having said all of that, I don't care what party you're in, it's never easy to cut. Mm -hmm. um, you only hear from the groups of people who are impacted negatively. Right. Um, and so that is a difficult exercise. And I did choose to really embrace my cabinet and give them targets mm -hmm. and say, you know, this is what I need you to do, but I'm not going to say you must get rid of this program and you must, you know, shrink that program by 5%. Here's what we need to do and let's approach it together. And so I think that did empower them. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped to make the really difficult decisions um, that were uh, in front of us. So you, how often would you have the whole cabinet meet together? Or? Uh, we met, so I'm trying to remember, it's been a long yeah, time. Yeah. We had weekly staff you know, meetings, sometimes twice a week. Um, I think the cabinet met every other week, um, but when we were in the midst of budget issues, it was more frequent than that. Okay. So let me go back to your, your current work at, in leadership studies, but, and, and, and do you think of the skills, background, training necessary for leadership in the public sector, and particularly as governor, different, that those jobs are, in what ways are they different or similar to other leadership positions? So I think they're very different. Yeah. Um, part of the reason that I got involved in leadership studies is I was a, a often guest speaker to talk about the differences uh, in managing the public sector versus the private sector. I think a few things. I think how you communicate and communicate your prior priorities is extremely different. Mm -hmm. um, how you are held accountable for your job performance is also extremely different. So uh, if you're in a good organization in the private sector, you either have a board of directors. So now I'm in the private sector. I'm the CEO of a company. Mm -hmm. I you know, do calls with my board every month. Um, I do, you know, we do in-person board meetings every quarter. They have an executive session. I get feedback. You know, I establish performance management objectives every year and I know how I'm progressing mm -hmm. against those. It's very structured. One of the hard things in public sector leadership is, you know, you don't have, you know, a set of agreed upon performance management objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, you have those issues that you have elevated as being important uh, during your campaign and hopefully you have a mandate, um, but you don't get the same kind of feedback. Um, certainly polls serve as something of feedback, but that's really not a replacement for the kind of direct uh, job performance and leadership input you get in the private sector. So I think that is something that requires uh, a lot of strategic thought. You know, how do I know if I'm doing a good job? Mm -hmm. Who are the people I pay attention to? Who do I consult? How do I get advice? The other thing is, um, for the most part, uh, at the gu gubernatorial level, governors are leading really large organizations uh, and really large organizations that are covered incessantly in the press. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a issue of alignment with your cabinet and with the people who work for you because you don't speak to people who are in policymaking um, positions on a really frequent basis. And you obviously try to be very clear to your cabinet. You try to be very clear in your communication through the press. But if you're in a state like Massachusetts or New Jersey mm -hmm. or New York, where the legislature and public policy and state government is covered you know, by multiple news organizations, there's going to be lots of stories that are going to be off message. Um, that's not just an issue for a governor in terms of how you know, they convince the public to view them, but it's also an issue for how they continue to manage this m massive uh, organization that they need to keep moving forward because your cabinet secretary hears from you once every two weeks mm -hmm. and hears from your direct staff a couple times on issues, but they're out there doing lots of things mm -hmm. that add up to sort of the essence of what your administration does. And they see a article in the newspaper where people are, you know, unnamed sources are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, supposing that something is happening right. or other is happening, that impacts them that impacts their view of sort of what they think they should be doing or the issues they think they need to address on your behalf. So that's sort of how you keep your direct reports, your cabinet, and how you keep uh, policy uh, setting officials at the uh, lower levels than that 
aligned uh, when you have all this noise is maybe one way to think of mm -hmm. it going on, I think is one of the real core challenges to public sector leadership that, you know, you have you know, somebody who's running a multi-billion dollar organization has some of the similar issues of, you know, have how do they cascade priorities and mm -hmm. culture down through, but they don't have that you know, uh, omnipresent media commentary that influences that communication um, to deal with. And when they do sometimes, you, you see how ugly it can be if you're a, you know, public company that all of a sudden is in a scandal uh, and you do have that sort of period of intense media scrutiny, it, it can be a daunting challenge for governors of big states uh, and certainly, you know, other executive leaders higher up in government, um, that is a, um, a, just a pervasive challenge. Mm. I wonder if there were, um, were ex experiences you had in your youth or be before you got into certainly as governor or lieutenant governor that led you to a particular position or to a focus on a particular issue. I'm thinking of an example that I know of in New Jersey is Governor Tom Kane had when he was in graduate school, seen Lincoln Center being constructed in New York City and seen the impact it was having on the neighborhood, which led him, was one of the things that led him to push for a performing arts center in Newark. Yeah. And if there was any, I mean, you had certainly family experiences right at the time you were yeah. being governor. But, um, it actually, ironically, I'm heading tomorrow to my 25th reunion at Trinity College, mm -hmm. which is a great liberal arts institution, but uh, it was my arrival on that campus almost 30 years ago that probably um, drove me to be as passionate as I am about uh, high quality education experiences being accessible to all folks. Um, I came from a family who was really committed to education. It was always expected we would go to college, um, but we lived in a you know aging blue collar industrial city with, as it turned out, I didn't know at the time, fairly mediocre uh, public schools. Mm -hmm. And I showed up on campus at Trinity and um, intending to be an English major and took my first two courses in English and struggled mightily with my writing. I had been by far the best writer or one of the best writers in my high school. Um, but my skills weren't as sharp as mm -hmm. some of my peers who had been prepared at um, either better public schools or some of the most elite private schools in our country. And that did have a very formative, um, make a very formative impression on me. And I've spent the last 20 years uh, in and out of government trying to figure out how we drive excellence to every corner of our education system, public schools, charters, um, through school choice, uh, access to higher education. Uh, it is still the case, I believe, that one of the fundamental differences in our country that makes us great is the ability for folks to have unlimited opportunity and you get that unlimited opportunity through a high quality education. Um, the availability of a high quality education is really hit or miss in our country today. And you know the economic challenges we're going through right now, um, I believe, are the tip of the iceberg of having a large swath of our workforce not having received the skills they needed to uh, help themselves and us to be uh, economically successful. So um, for me, it was probably that day I realized, um, and a lot of kids like me who grew up in small towns uh, realize that you get to college and you know, I realized two things, um, that there were people who are way richer than anything I ever knew existed. <laughs> um, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't believe I had ever heard of a BMW uh, car uh -huh. uh, before I arrived on campus. Um, but also that, you know, that wealth and the type of privilege that they had, had afforded them uh, a lot of opportunities that a lot of my peers didn't have. Um, on the flip side of that, I also felt extraordinarily, extraordinarily lucky mm -hmm. um, to be there and getting that same education and felt that um, brought with it an obligation to uh, give back. I have, I'm just going to ask one more question because I, I, I know we're, you're pressed for time. But the um, Alan Rosenthal, who is 
t teaches here and is, is an expert on state legislatures, has written a book recently about governors called The Best Job in Politics. Yeah. And I was thinking, knowing you were coming in, that, that in Massachusetts, several people who came before you and after you apparently didn't think so, that you had both, as you mentioned, uh, William Weld and Paul Salucci, who were governors who, in one case, tried to, in the other case, received an ambassadorship, but both left office. And then you had uh, Mitt Romney, who served one term and didn't run for re-election. Were those just personal circumstances on their So part? I actually disagree. I think okay. it is the best job, and I think they yeah. would agree, too. Uh -huh. um, part of how they categorized it as right. being the best job is it um, opens up opportunities to even better oh, okay. jobs. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that you might not have had uh -huh. if you uh, weren't governor. But uh, I do believe, people ask me a lot um, yeah. if I'm going to ever run for anything again. Yeah. I had the best job right. in right. government. I mean, yeah. it, it can be searingly brutal and painful. The amount of public scrutiny was something that I don't think I was, I know I wasn't right. prepared for, yeah. and I'm not sure if anybody could be. Right. Um, right. And it was a little more... Uh, jarring in my life because it happened at the same time as I was going through some fairly significant uh, life-changing yeah. experiences like having children. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I still um, get an opportunity because I did that to do great and meaningful work. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't you know, choose to leave to go on to another government job, but mm -hmm. I absolutely work every day to continue to try to improve public education through my private sector work. But I also think you know, I got to make an impact on how kids in our foster care system are able to access a college education. Um, we put in place one of the best uh, education reform systems of any state and were named a national model and it's still largely uh, driving public policy uh, in Massachusetts today. And Massachusetts has among some of the best public schools in the country. It's not a job that's done by any means yet, but uh, we had some real accomplishments. Mm -hmm. I, I met some really cool people. <laughs> I you know, got to do some really interesting right. things. Um, so I, I do think it is a fabulous job. And I think um, it's a fabulous job in many states because you get that nice balance of being close enough to be able to impact mm -hmm. issues where you can see the difference you're making, um, but you are at enough of a level and have enough power that those impacts can be pretty amazing in their reach and sometimes pretty lasting. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.